So thank you very much for the introduction, Ivan, and thanks for the opportunity to take part here. And when I was putting this session together, I was really reflecting on uh, the great opportunity that I had to help Dr. Popovich bring together uh, this selection of articles from the Aspatar Sports Medicine Journal. In putting that together, I got the chance to go back through and read all of our journal issues. And obviously our journal now has been going for quite some time. And some of those articles that we were looking at at the time, when they were published many years ago, perhaps our thinking has changed now, some things are timeless. But it got me to reflecting on where we're going to be in about 10 years from now. And no doubt we're going to be looking back at some of the things that we think about now and think, gee, I can't believe that we used to do that. And some of those things are going to hold up. So in putting together this panel this evening for their talks, uh, what I've hoped to do is to try, I mean, in fact, the instructions to all of these guys were, I want you to think about the practicing clinician in the audience. I want you to keep your talks nice and short and just tell them where the research can inform their clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So since I'm putting the session together, I get to go first. Uh, and so we're also lucky enough to have um, use of the Aspatar jet here this evening. So we're going to get to fly around the world. And here, if I'm right, here we go. So what has research ever done for my hamstring or hopefully for your hamstring patients? So here we are at Aspatar this evening, and the first thing of the three main sections that I want to talk about today when I'm reflecting on the mistakes that I have made throughout my career and the big changes that I think has come across over the last few years is I really think that we need to think about actually changing the tissue and some big mistakes that we've been making that I'll go through in these first couple of sessions. So back, well, close to 30 years ago now when I first started practice and really for perhaps the first 15 years of that time, everything was about static posture and there was some way that some tight or weak muscles or loose or overactive muscles would then influence the static position of different bones. And because of course we knew that basically human beings were exactly the same as cars, if humans got out of alignment then of course there would be all sorts of problems to pay. Now, you're a lot smarter than I am so you can probably see a few weaknesses in there, but we carried on with these assumptions and so we took a whole bunch of different measures to check those static alignments. And unfortunately, it didn't matter what was wrong with you, what we found wrong, because everybody just needed some manual therapy and then an injection of gluteals and abdominals. Now, maybe that was a good idea, but unfortunately, the mistake that in retrospect I think we made was those injections of gluteals and abdominals were overcomplicated and underloaded exercises. And that's a mistake that I think we still make until today. And when you're doing exercises like that, unfortunately, in the presence of injury or in the presence of normal tissue, you're not going to end up with any hypertrophy or any meaningful changes in those structures. So any advantages that you give your patient are probably incidental to any of the treatment that, we're, that we were applying. So these days now reflecting on what is it that we're doing if exercise is the cor cornerstone of the exercise uh, of the management approaches that we should do. And we're absolutely spoiled for choice in the kind of exercises we can choose for our hamstring uh, injured clients. And the assumption has been, or what I'm seeing, is that the more complicated you make your exercises, then that, how some, that somehow makes those exercises more tailored, and that'll somehow end up with better care. And I'm not sure. I think the jury's still out on that. I can't come down strongly one way or the other, and we've got a lot of speakers coming after tonight who's going to tell us a lot more useful things about exercise prescription. So what are the next mistakes we make? Well, we need to be measuring things, I think. And you saw we were taking a whole bunch of different measures and of the measures that it, we actually can say they really do measure something, these flexibility measures were terribly popular. And I know I've spent many hours measuring static flexibility of different athletes at different times. And then now when I reflect on our athletes actually getting injuries, and these are genuinely the first three random hamstring injuries that I saw. So we'll see our friend here there's a hamstring injury that he had. Now perhaps this guy who just reached out, maybe you could run the argument that his flexibility or lack thereof could be somehow associated. But that's, I think, a relatively unusual case that we saw and we don't even know whether the, the flexibility was associated with that. But this guy just here, again, 
where was the static flexibility or these static measures associated with what that guy was actually doing on the pitch. And if we had been smart enough to look back in the literature, um, now more than 20 years ago, this stuff had been investigated by guys who are a lot smarter than obviously I am. And they took these exact same measurements and then they asked these guys to go and okay, they weren't playing a game of football, they were running in a straight line and running quite fast in a straight line. And how well, for example, did this flexibility correlate to what these guys went, did when they actually went and got out into straight line running? So this was their hip extension flexibility measure that they took and then how much hip extension range of motion did these guys show when they actually ran fast over ground. And it turned out there was a relationship between them. It was a weak relationship, perhaps because they didn't have enough subjects, but it was in exactly the opposite direction to what we tell our patients. That's what this minus sign means here. So the hip extension flexibility that they showed on the bench was negatively correlated with the hip extension flexibility they showed when they ran in a straight line. All right, well, perhaps flexibility has not been terribly much use, and we've seen a lot of research that tells us that, so maybe we're tossing that out now. And these days, everything's in the core, and core control and core activation. And I could never remember whether we were supposed to be getting our patients to turn their hamstrings on before their glutes or their glutes before their hamstrings, but this is basically how we were assessing it in the clinic. Again, this had been looked at so many years ago, and again, by people a whole bunch smarter than me, uh, we won't go through the details here, but I'll tell you that these guys gave themselves every chance of finding something correlated with something else by looking at a whole bunch of different measures and looking at a whole bunch of different outcomes. So they had 18 chances just by luck alone to have something come out and nothing was significantly correlated in terms of um, abdominal strength. The strongest correlation that they got was 0.32, which means about a ninth or uh, about 11% of the variance was explained or looked at a better way, 90% of the variance explained during actual movements was not explained by uh, core control. So what's the mistakes that we're making currently that, well, that perhaps we're making these days, repeating the mistakes of the past? Well, nowadays we don't have to rely on bad measurements because we all have a supercomputer with a high-speed camera and so we can take photos of our athletes. And again, I just suggest a little bit of caution before we jump there. And this has been taught to me by a friend and colleague, Rula Kotsafaki, who's uh, one of the physios who works here, but really she's a biomechanist. And she's shown me that for a start, these measurements, so this particular guy here, we're looking at how bent the knee is, and this is the same athlete hopping as far as he can horizontally. He's doing about 10 degrees or 10, 15 degrees less peak knee flexion in one of these legs. I'll defy you to tell me which leg it is because I just can't see it with my naked eye. More importantly though, it's not the range of motion. So this is another guy that I've really slowed down to give you every chance to be able to see the difference. He's running over ground at about seven and a half, eight meters per second while we do this. And there's a difference in the amount of knee straightening that he's doing and it's only about two degrees but far more importantly, the amount of work that his knee is doing. So one of his knees, when he lands, he's doing negative work, he's absorbing, and then there's the propulsion phase. He's doing about a third or less work on one of his knees, both during the absorption and in the propulsion phases. Again, you cannot see this with your naked eye, unfortunately. It's not the joint angles that cause injury, it's the forces, you can't see forces. So it's all been doom and gloom so far. What do we take out of it? What have I learned that I've changed with my patients? And it comes back to the problem is the solution. The thing that we have to fix is the thing that got us into trouble in the first place. And in this case, by and large with hamstring injury, it's fast running. So fast running, and I'll, again, there's more talks going to come up this evening, which tells us uh, in much better detail about um, the exercises we should be doing. So I'll just concentrate on one here, which was done a few years ago now. And these guys looked at a whole bunch of different exercises. We'll focus on this one here. Um, the exercises that these guys did during the, um, sorry, during the study, they compared them to fast running on one of these treadmills, a curved treadmill. So all the different exercises here were, were normalized to how much activation they saw during fast running on a curved treadmill. As I said, we'll concentrate on this Nordic for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. And then so for all the exercises, we've got the fast running as this first bar, and here we're looking at the medial hamstrings, the semis, 
and the Nordic is probably the best activating of all of these and it comes up for the medial hamstrings to perhaps 70% but maybe as high as 100% of what's going on for the medial hamstrings. But you guys know that as far as hamstring injury is concerned, it's not the medial, it's the lateral hamstrings. And unfortunately, Nordics are less than half of what happens during fast running, at least as far as EMG is concerned. So that's led me to realize that these functional, overcomplicated, underloaded exercises that we were talking about, and many of us have been really afraid of doing Nordics, sprints are miles ahead of that. And if you think about the lateral hamstrings, and that's the one that we're really interested in over there, well, Nordics are only halfway to what's going to happen uh, in terms of where you're going to get to ultimately with what you need to do for these athletes, which is run fast. So it's obvious, and I'm just going to labour this point, if you need to run fast, you need to do a lot of fast running. Nordics are about the halfway point. They're not something for us to be scared of, but they're also not the finish line. The finish line for these guys should be fast running. And most of our injuries do come from fast running. So for just the football players, the first couple of hundred that we saw, most of their injuries were coming from the players reported fast running. So what should we be doing in the clinic? Well, we need to get our athletes doing back the same amount of fast running, the same volume and the same intensity that they need to do for their sport. And how much is that? Well, it really varies according to sport. So if we take one sport, and I'm deliberately taking some really old references here because this information has been around for years. Australian rules football is, played, is a game that's played over four quarters. Uh, and during uh, those four quarters, the athletes make a whole bunch of different movements. They end up with, if we count higher speed and very fast running, so above 20 and above 23 kilometers an hour, they're gonna average 1600 meters. But the devil's in the detail here. The standard deviation is 800 meters. So if you think preparing your athlete, you need to get them back to 1600 meters for that sport, it means you're under preparing the athletes for half of the games that they're gonna come up against. If you actually wanna prepare them for two thirds of the games, we need to add one standard deviation, 2.4K. Or if we need to prepare them for more than 95%, then we need to get up to about two standard deviations and that's 3.2K for these athletes. Different sports, different demands. Football, and now different levels. High level international players do about a quarter to a third more high intensity running and more than half more sprinting than professional players of a lower standard. Of course, it depends on the position you play as well and it probably won't surprise you guys who know more about football than me that defenders don't do as much fast running as strikers don't do as much fast running as midfielders. So the take home message that I get for you and before we hand over to our next speaker is you need to figure out what the demands of your athlete is and especially what those worst case demands are and probably frame that in terms of the amount of fast running that they're gonna to need to do. So now we'll move. Now we've got the Aspatar jet that I'll get you all to jump on board. So make sure you've got your tray tables in the upright position, seat backs uh, vertical. Seat belt snug and tight, put all your luggage in the overhead container and we'll jump around to wake Ryan Timmons up where he is in Melbourne, Australia and it's early in the morning for Ryan so hopefully, hopefully he's well dressed and awake and ready for us to go. Ryan is a lecturer at the Australian Catholic University and part of their Sprint Research Centre and he's um, strongly involved in doing research that hopefully translates across to sport and across to injury. And he tells us that his days as a futsal goalkeeper are certainly not behind him. So with that, Ryan. Uh, thanks, Rod. Thanks for the presentation, uh, the introduction. And uh, thanks for having me involved in this webinar series. I'll just share my slides and we can get going. So today I'll be presenting as part of the Aspatar webinar series on hamstring strain injuries. Uh, my name is Dr. Ryan Timmons. I'm from the Australian Catholic University uh, in Australia and uh, thank you for having me along Rod and, and hopefully this is uh, informative for you all. So my talk today will focus on a couple of topics. Uh, the first one looking at the magnitude and the laterality of muscle recruitment uh, during hamstring exercises and kind of focusing on this concept of exercise intensity to drive some favorable hamstring adaptations. So to start with I will introduce this concept of laterality. So when I speak about our concept of laterality, 
we're looking at the hamstrings here and we're comparing exercises that might recruit, say, more so the lateral hamstrings or the medial hamstrings. So there's balance between, say, one exercise, obviously recruiting a range of the hamstrings, but is one more medial or laterally biased in its recruitment? So this concept of laterality. So what does the literature say about exercises and their ability to recruit um, between the medial and lateral hamstrings? So here we've got a bit of work from a review from Matthew Bourne um, over here in Australia as well. And it's comparing what the evidence says with uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging and comparing the activation profile of certain exercises. So on the y-axis axis, we've got the exercise and on the x-axis we've got our um, intensity or, or ratio of medial or lateral hamstrings. So if it's less than one, we've got a relatively higher medial hamstring activation. If it's greater than one, we've got a greater amount of lateral hamstring activation. And what you can see is there's a pretty decent split between um, things being more, having a greater trend towards more lateral hamstring activation when they're actually hip dominant exercises. So anything really above here, we can see they're mainly hip based and we're probably getting over a 0.6 recruitment showing that probably more biceps femoris usage with our hip dominant exercises. Once we look at exercises that mainly focus on the knee, we go to a greater extent of medial hamstring recruitment than lateral. And so obviously these, base, these exercises such as the Nordic and so on and so forth are very knee based. And as a result, we have a greater recruitment of our medial hamstrings. But this is just one concept that we need to consider when selecting an exercise. This is just the balance between our lateral and our medial hamstrings. It's a big focus within the clinical space is do we just pick an exercise because it's more medially biased or more laterally biased? But one concept that gets lost when making this decision is the concept of magnitude and the magnitude related to intensity. So whilst you might have an exercise that more preferences the lateral hamstrings, it may be poor in its magnitude to actually do so. And what that actually looks like, I'll, I'll cover through now. When we speak of magnitude, um, we speak of basically how much of the muscles are recruited. Okay, we still have that balance between left and uh, between medial and lateral, but now we're looking at how high we can actually recruit those um, two groups of, excess of, of muscles. So again, some great work from Matty Bourne in uh, Queensland, Australia. And basically some of the work he did is he had a bunch of exercises we can see here, some hip-based, some knee-based, and compared the, the extent or how much these muscles are active um, during certain exercises. What we've got here is that balance between our medial and our lateral hamstrings from these exercises. So on the y-axis, we've got our lateral hamstring EMG, so how much the lateral hammies were activated during these exercises. So the higher up we go, the more lateral hamstring we use. And on the x-axis, we've got our medial hamstring activation, so the further along we go, the more medial hamstring we use. So we pick out two comparison exercises, one being the knee-based Nordic, and then one being the hip-based hip extension and a 45 degree. And we can see, as what we got from the last slide, our hip extension exercise on the left-hand side of this diagonal line is more biceps femoris active. Basically what this diagonal line is, is that, that balance of one, again, whether it's a medial or a lateral dominant exercise. So hip extension is more medial, or more lateral, sorry, than medial hamstring dominant, whereas our Nordic, being on the right-hand side of this line, is more medial hamstring than lateral hamstring. So that takes the concept of laterality. But one thing that's missed a lot is this concept of intensity or magnitude. So with our Nordics, we can see here, whilst they're a medial dominant exercise, they're still the greatest recruiter of our lateral hamstrings as well. Our hip extension, our greatest lateral hamstring recruiter, actually has a lower amount of lateral hamstring recruitment relative to the Nordic. So magnitude is really important. This intensity is really important. Comparably, the medials we can see 
there's that balance between uh, the recruitment. So our Nordics is probably the best exercise to recruit both of the hamstring muscles to their maximal capacity, whilst being more medial biased in its recruitment. Yeah, so it might recruit the medials more than the laterals, but overall, compared to other exercises, it's much better at getting the laterals going than what the, the others are. So then there's this balance between intensity and volume. You can't train intense forever, but you can't always just do nothing at low intensity. So there's always a balance between prescribing high intensity exercise, especially in uh, when we're looking at using this magnitude driven approach and that balancing that with training volumes and how many repetitions we do in a gym at certain intensities. So this leads me into my next concept, which is why programming just three sets of 10 doesn't work anymore. And we consider how much our intensity and our programming of these exercises comes into play. We need to consider this much more. So one example we've got here is why three by 10 or typically well, in this actual study, it was 12 by 10 by eight just really isn't done anymore. So the best evidence we've got for injury prevention in elite sport is using the Nordic hamstring exercise from um, some of the work done by Christian Thorberg and, and co in, in 2011 in the Peterson study. And there's a follow-up work undertaken recently looking at the actual adherence to these exercise programs in Champions League football teams. So the prescription of this evidence-based training is that in season, after doing this pre-season kind of dose, that teams are required to do at least 30 repetitions a week. So if this evidence-based approach, which is the best approach we have, at reducing the risk of hamstring strain injury suggests that Champions League teams should be doing 30 repetitions of a Nordic per week. Um, if not, they're, they're not compliant. Probably needs to be considered in context. So this has some context. Manchester City in November 2018. Uh, just a random year and month picked out, but this is their schedule for that period of time. So a Champions League team trying to undertake 30 repetitions of the Nordic per week, ideally in one session. So let's have a look at where we could possibly fit this in. Okay, maybe there, that's probably about it. We could possibly put one in here before the Man United game, but it's highly unlikely you're going to get more than one session in in a week, especially when you've got so many games close together. So this then creates the consideration, because remember our Nordic was very high is magnitude of recruitment of the muscles. So we need to find this balance between a highly intense exercise and the volume with which we can do. So possibly not 30 repetitions, but maybe could we do lower volumes and maybe still get some favorable adaptations that may possibly help us reduce the risk of injury. There's some evidence we've got from some training we've done here in Australia from Joel Preslin's uh, research. In 2018, we compared a high volume Nordic training exercise intervention to a low volume intervention and looked at strength and structural adaptations as a result. So if we do low volume or high volume training, so the high volume guys did much more than what we actually saw in the Norwegian um, group, or sorry, the, the Scandinavian group, and we actually saw a 34% improvement in strength and basically no difference between the groups. So doing high volume or low volume, you can still get stronger. Architecturally, looking more so at muscle fascicle length, we can see that both groups improved muscle fascicle length longer uh, over, over the, over the six-week intervention. So from here, you can see there's no added benefit to doing more exercise um, than we have to. So that balance between intensity and volume is key. But one key take home for me, and like I said, this is that main point here, is the intensity of the exercise. So the Nordic is quite hard and quite um, taxing. But in that study that I just presented, the big take home is whilst you might be able to, yes, do lower volumes, the intensity of those lower volumes are really, really important. Okay, if you still want to drive favorable adaptations, you need to still have people training at a high intensity. 
And how is that maintained once you do, you know, maybe 10 weeks of training of two sets of four is adding weight. So here's one uh, example of a participant we had um, at some point in the training study, he utilized a Nordic with body weight and an additional 35 kilograms held to his chest. And you can see here, this is probably set one. And you may have gone back a little bit as you went. That's what we're looking at for that intensity of effort. So whilst we may have a lower volume, we do need to still consider that intensity is part of our prescription and also part of our um, calculation of volume. So really need to consider intensity. It just gets lost in the wash a lot. And to continue on that, we actually have some evidence to show this. So say if we did six weeks of low volume training, so carrying on that same intervention that we did in the Preslin study, we have low volume training, two sets of four of the Nordic, again, done at a very high intensity. We compared the people that just used the body weight approach, so they get stronger, they get really good at the Nordic, and then they stop really getting overloaded. And then we had guys that we just kept loading up with lots of weight to make sure every effort was really, really hard and really full. And we compared what happened. We also did use an exercise called the razor, but I won't talk about that today. So basically what we saw from an architectural point of view, uh, the guys that used the body weight only had a 5% improvement in architecture and the guys that used the extra weight had about a 15% improvement in their architecture. So this kind of gives us the idea that maybe the improvements that we get over six weeks from a low volume intervention really need to be matched with a high intensity if we're going that low volume. That, that intensity is really key and can't be forgotten. From a strength perspective, both groups improved around about 19% about in their levels of eccentric strength. Again, like I mentioned, the average weight held at the end of training was around about 20 to 30 kilograms. And that's a big key component we need to consider in regards to our intensity of prescription. Last thing to kind of finish off is about running intensity. Okay, we're talking a lot about gym-based prescription, but again, intensity really matters when we're considering our intensity of prescription for running or sprinting. Here we've got some work from Shumanov and the guys in 2007, looking at the amount of muscle tendon length change, the amount of muscular force and the muscle tenderness work. Also, this is considered the amount of eccentric or negative work done by the hamstrings during certain speeds of maximum sprinting. So obviously the higher up we've got, we've got a higher change relative to their maximum. So what we're seeing here is across the speed spectrum, if we're at 80%, 85, 90, 95, 100%, our muscle tendon unit length doesn't really change from 80% onwards. The length of our muscle doesn't really modify with increases in speed. The amount of force produced has this linear relationship as we improve intensity. So the faster we run, the greater amount of force that we're actually having go through that MTU. And that's pretty linear. So as you go from 80 to 85, it's pretty decent step to 99.95. The one that's very interesting is it says a big peak here in the amount of negative work, so the amount of eccentric work the hamstrings do when we go from 95 to 100%. So you can see that decent jump in the amount of intensity, the amount of work, the negative work the hamstrings do. So we really need to consider, and this highlights really well, how important max velocity is. So if you're prescribing high intensity sprinting and you're going 80%, 85%, you're possibly missing out on almost 30 or 40% of negative work when you're thinking, oh, 80% is close enough to 100. Well, you're actually probably missing out a fair chunk of intensity here that might be useful for your participants or for your, for your clinicians. So for me, just finishing off, some key important take-home messages. Laterality is important if you're trying to recruit the hamstrings, but also consider magnitude. Uh, magnitude is driven by intensity. Um, we need to really need to consider that, just that balance between the two medials or laterals, but how hard they work. Three by 10 doesn't cut mustards anymore. We need to actually go quite hard and doing things quite hard. You can't do that three sets of 10, especially in practice when you have three games in a week. 
when we program things, we do need to remember that intensity is part of our programming calculation for volume. So sets by reps by intensity. If you just go three by 10 and you don't change that, uh, you go and forget that intensity is a really key factor of our programming. Running intensity is key. Again, the balance between 80% and 95%, even 100% of max sprinting has a big difference to the implication of the hamstring work that we do. Uh, so for me to say thank you for today, uh, for having me involved, Rod and the guys at Aspatar. Again, everything I present today is not just all my own work, but a bunch of work that we do across the group. And we wouldn't be where we are today without Dr. Anthony Shield, um, Dr. Moore Williams and Dr. David Opar. So thanks to everybody on the slide and thanks to everybody in Doha and around the world for listening. Now, I realize I've made a bit of a mistake here and I'm wasting a whole bunch of fuel in the Aspatar jet because we were just a moment ago down in uh, Melbourne, Australia, where we've also got Dr. Jack Hickey, who's at the Australian Catholic University. And Jack Hickey is an absolute rising star in uh, the research world, but especially in the world of hamstrings, who's won a whole bunch of awards for best PhD, best young researcher. And I mean, he's done so much in such a short period of time. Frankly, I don't know what I've been doing with myself. And more to the point, I think Jack is going to prove to us that not all Australians are dishevelled at this time of the morning. So if we just wend our way back down to the bottom of the world again, and we'll have a look and see how we find Jack. Jack, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Rod, for the introduction. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, having me present as part of this uh, webinar series, uh, lecture series. Um, the topic of the presentation uh, that I'm going to give is on pain and exercise progression uh, during hamstring strain injury rehabilitation. Um, for those of you who uh, maybe haven't even met me or, or seen me present before, my name is Jack Hickey, um, and I'm an accredited exercise physiologist from Melbourne, Australia, and I work as a lecturer and researcher um, at the Australian Catholic University uh, here in Melbourne. Um, I work quite closely uh, with Dr. David Opar and Dr. Ryan Timmons in the hamstring injury space. Um, and also a bunch of other colleagues as part of the Sprint Research Centre uh, here at ACU. I'll uh, just bring up my presentation slides here. Okay, so as the title of the presentation suggests, uh, we're going to be touching on pain and progressive eccentric exercise during uh, rehabilitation and perhaps some alternative strategies to accelerating uh, the progression of eccentric loading throughout hamstring injury rehab. So to start off, we want to think about as a rehabilitation practitioner, what is our aim? Well, our aim if we're working with someone with hamstring strain injury is to get them back on the field and back playing sport. And to do that, we're going to implement a number of different rehabilitation interventions, um, pre predominantly exercise-based uh, interventions, and most of them will be something to do with progressive hamstring loading. Now, when we uh, think about hamstring injury rehab, this is just one aspect of hamstring injury rehab. We also have other treatments that are prescribed, might be passive therapies, stretching or flexibility exercises, exercises for other muscles of the lumbopelvic region, as well as running technique drills have also become quite popular. But with all of these different types of exercise or different types of rehab intervention, sometimes as rehab practitioners, we can get distracted by the, the new intervention or the, the new fat on the market and that means that we can actually get a little bit distracted by these and perhaps not have as much focus on progressive hamstring loading as we should throughout the rehab process. And so I'm not here today to talk about the efficacy of one intervention versus the other, but just make clear that what we're gonna focus on in this presentation and what we have focused on in our research has been more this concept of progressive hamstring loading. So when we talk about what that actually means, when we talk about ha progressive hamstring loading, what we're really talking about is progressive strength training. Um, and typically what we want to include is some form of long length hip dominant uh, hamstring exercise, such as a 45 degree uh, Roman chair hip extension shown up the top, or an eccentric knee flexor based movement, such as a Nordic hamstring exercise, because we know that these are beneficial exercises for promoting positive adaptations in the hamstrings. But we also know that the most specific stimulus for the hamstrings in terms of uh, returning an athlete to most running-based sports is going to be exposure to high-speed running. So 
obviously the hamstrings get loaded progressively as we increase in running speeds, particularly above about 80% of our maximal velocity. So we want to be including adequate exposure to this throughout the rehabilitation process as well. Now, when we think about rehab, there's sometimes barriers to implementing progressive hamstring loading. One of the potential barriers to implementing progressive loading following an acute hamstring strain injury is pain. If you look at the literature, one of the most common guidelines seen, irrespective of the type of exercise intervention, is to only perform and progress exercise in the complete absence of pain or where pain is rated as a zero out of 10 or zero on a zero to 10 scale. Now, this is okay if rehab lasts a long time because you can allow pain to dissipate and then still have adequate exposure to progressive hamstring loading. However, particularly in elite sporting environments, we know that there's pressure to accelerate return to play clearance and get athletes back on the field as quickly as possible. And this perhaps shortens the window of time that we actually have available for implementing that progressive hamstring loading. The potential issues with that are that we know that following hamstring strain injury and return to play clearance, athletes with a previous hamstring strain injury often display residual deficits in key variables associated with hamstring strain injury risk. You can see down the bottom left here, um, an image of my colleague Ryan Timmons assessing biceps femoris long head muscle architecture. And we know that fascicle length is associated with hamstring injury risk and those with a previous hamstring injury often have shortened biceps femoris long head fascicles. On the right, you see uh, someone performing an eccentric hamstring exercise, the Nordic, Nordic curl, and we can measure that uh, using the Nordboard device and having a look at eccentric knee flexor strength. We also know that athletes following a hamstring strain injury are often weak. And so we have these two residual risk factors of short fascicles and weakness during eccentric knee flexor contractions that potentially increase our risk of suffering a re-injury because these things maybe haven't been addressed throughout the rehabilitation period. So when we sort of took a look at this um, a number of years ago now, we thought, well, how can we maybe short circuit this um, lack of progressive hamstring loading in rehab? We're probably not going to be able to ask athletes to stay in rehab for longer and prolong that return to play clearance time. So we need to look at the other barrier, which is pain, and consider is this or are these residual deficits in hamstring structure and function an outcome of no pain, no gain? And this was a concept that we explored in a randomised control trial, which was published in JOSPT uh, last year. Uh, and basically what we did in this study is we had a group of uh, athletes, uh, 43 of them, uh, with clinically confirmed acute hamstring strain injuries present to us. Now, these individuals all followed the exact same rehabilitation program. What was included in that rehabilitation program was focused on progressive hamstring loading. Uh, they followed this program all the way through to achieving return to play clearance. And so what you can see here is from the start of rehabilitation, all participants in this study were exposed to three exercises. These were three bilateral hamstring exercises, starting at the top left with a 45 degree hamstring bridge. In the middle, you can see an eccentric sliding leg curl. And then on the right, we have a 45 degree hip extension. All three of the exercises are started bilateral to allow the athletes to selectively load or unload their injured leg uh, based on what they can tolerate. Then each of those exercises was individually progressed. So the hamstring bridge goes from bilateral to unilateral. The 45 degree hip extension, the same. And then with this sliding leg curl, we had two exercises that were added. One was a unilateral sliding leg curl shown down the bottom left. And the other was the Nordic hamstring exercise. So each exercise was progressed once the athlete could perform the bilateral, the appropriate bilateral variation for a prescribed repetition range. In addition to these strengthening exercises, we also included a progressive running protocol. And this protocol was based on the work of Amy Silder and her colleagues from back in 2013. And what we did is we used a 50 metre uh, running space that we had available to us uh, on site here at the university. And over that 50 metre distance, we progressed our athletes from a walk jog uh, progression, moving to a jog run jog, and then eventually up to a run sprint run where one of our final return to play clearance criteria was the ability to run with 100% effort with no pain or apprehension. So all participants followed that rehab protocol. The only difference was we had 
22 participants who were allocated to a pain-free rehabilitation group. So they were only allowed to perform and progress within absolute pain-free limits, as is commonly recommended. Then we also had a pain threshold group. Now, this group was allowed to continue performing and progressing exercise up to a limit of four out of 10 on that zero to 10 numeric pain rating scale. Now, our two primary outcome measures were, did this change how long it took our athletes to get back to return to play clearance? And also, did it impact on their risk of re-injury at six month follow-up time point? Let's start by having a look at the return to play clearance time. What you can see here is uh, a step plot where on the y-axis we have the percentage of participants in each group and on the x-axis you've got the number of days following acute hamstring strain injury. The blue shows the pain-free group and the orange shows the pain threshold group. Now you can see that there's a bit of overlap between the two groups here but if we actually then plot a horizontal line at the median or to represent the median return to play clearance time we can see the pain-free group took 15 days to get back and the pain threshold group 17 days. But there's a large amount of overlap in the 95% confidence intervals, which basically means there was no statistical difference between our two groups. So both had relatively brief periods of rehabilitation, but no difference or no change by allowing low levels of pain. If we take a look at the return to play clearance time, just on another figure here, showing each individual data point, again, you can see the amount of overlap and the fact that there was no statistical or no clinically meaningful difference between the two groups. The other outcome was having a look at uh, those athletes who went on to sustain a re-injury six months after being cleared. And there was no difference between the two groups, at least from the point of view if we had relatively low uh, overall participant numbers, but also relatively low numbers of re-injuries. So only two participants in each group, so less than 10% re-injury rate uh, overall, which you know is a relatively uh, successful outcome uh, considering some prior work showing some slightly higher rates of re-injury. Now, if there's no major difference in return to play clearance times or uh, re-injury rates, then we might think, well, what's the benefit of perhaps eliciting some pain uh, during rehab exercises? And for that, we actually really need to look at the changes in hamstring muscle structure and function. So we actually measured eccentric knee flexor strength throughout the study whenever they performed the Nordic hamstring exercise and rehabilitation. And on the x-axis, we can see eccentric knee flexor strength is measured by the Nord board. And to provide some context to our data, we can also plot a vertical line uh, crossing that x-axis, which is taken from Ryan Timmons' PhD work um, in elite soccer players. It shows that about 337 newtons of strength is the statistical cut point for increased or decreased risk of hamstring strain injury. We can then do the same for biceps femoris long head fascicle length, which we measured uh, before every rehabilitation session. And again, we can plot the horizontal line here at 10.56 centimetres. Now, this gives us a nice graph with four quadrants, where down the bottom left, we're considered to be short and weak and at greater risk of hamstring injury, or the top right, where we want our athletes to be long and strong and somewhat protected from hamstring strain injury. From the start of rehab, we can see most of our participants sat within the short and weak category, but by the end, they were able to make a large shift up to that long and strong category. Now, this is looking at all of our participants lumped together. If we actually then take a look at the group level, what we see is that both groups ended up in the long and strong category, but if you pay particular attention to the x-axis and eccentric knee flexor strength, there was a difference between the two groups and greater strength gains in that pain threshold group. So the first take-home message here is that following hamstring strain injury, even in relatively short periods of return to play clearance or brief periods of rehabilitation, we are able to make adaptations in terms of increasing fascicle length and eccentric knee flexor strength. But perhaps it's not so much a case of no pain, no gain, but perhaps no pain, slightly less gain, which certainly isn't as catchy of a title. But basically, if we allow low levels of pain during exercise, we might get some additional benefits, particularly with strengthening the hamstrings throughout rehabilitation. Now, because we saw these big improvements in terms of strength and fascicle length in both groups, we were actually recently gone back and had another look at our data to take a closer look at how well did we expose our athletes to eccentric loading? Because we know this is what leads to changes in fascicle length and eccentric strength. So here we're going to take a look at uh, a conventional model of how hamstring strength exercises tend to be progressed throughout rehab. So generally speaking, these exercises are split and 
at the start of rehab, most rehab protocols will introduce isometric loading and then gradually progress to in, in, in implement more eccentric exercises as part of rehabilitation. The main barrier to getting from isometric to eccentric is often being pain-free or the resolution of pain during isometric knee flexion. Now, when we designed our rehab protocol, we actually decided not to implement isometric exercise and we actually implemented eccentric exercise from the start of rehabilitation. And rather than waiting for the resolution of pain on isometric contractions to guide when we actually progress this eccentric loading, what we did is we used what we call an exercise specific progression model, where once the athletes could safely perform that exercise through the prescribed repetition range, we then added uh, more challenging variations. So as you can see here, the unilateral slider and the Nordic hamstring exercise uh, were added at that point. What we did with the data with our 43 participants from that RCT, we went back and had a look at how long it actually took them to progress from this bilateral slider to the unilateral variation and to the Nordic hamstring exercise and compare this to how long it took them to be pain-free on an isometric strength test, which we also collected throughout rehabilitation. And what we can see from this figure here on the y-axis, we have the percentage of participants achieving each of those milestones combining both the pain-free and the pain threshold group together. On the x-axis, the number of days from hamstring strain injury. What you can see in the light grey is that the progression of eccentric loading occurs significantly earlier than how long it actually took them to be pain-free on an isometric contraction. And this was on average seven days earlier, meaning you basically we were able to Im implement or accelerate eccentric loading by one week uh, during hamstring injury rehab. And you might think one week isn't a very long period of time. However, if we factor in, we've got return to play clearance times of just over two weeks, then being able to accelerate exposure to eccentric loading a week earlier really is clinically significant in terms of actually um, hopefully eliciting adaptation. Now, it's one thing to do these exercises a little bit earlier. We also want to have a look at how well they were tolerated. If we have a look at our eccentric exercises compared to our isometric strength test, we can actually look at how many participants reported pain the first time they tried them. So firstly, looking at the bilateral slider, the majority of participants were pain-free. For the unilateral slider, we had a few more participants report pain, but still the majority were completely pain-free. And surprisingly, with the Nordic hamstring exercise, around 80% of our participants, the first time that exercise was introduced, were able to perform it completely pain-free. But if we compare that, to that same session where they first perform those eccentric exercises and we take a look at the pain during an isometric, we actually see the opposite, that about 80% was still reporting pain during an isometric knee flexor strength test. We suggest that normally we'd be holding these athletes back from progressing when in actual fact they're able to perform these exercises safely. We could also have a look at some objective strength data, which we collected during all of these exercises, and we could look at injured leg relative to uninjured leg in terms of knee flexor force output on the y-axis. This green zone represents 90% and above or within 10% deficit. And then what we can see is from the bilateral slider, the unilateral slider, and the Nordic hamstring exercise, the first time participants performed these, the majority sat well and truly within between limb uh, symmetry, with the average being close to 100% across all of them. The same session, if we look at the isometric strength tests, we see the opposite. Most people have a strength deficit, which normally practitioners would look at and say, you're not ready to go and do an eccentric exercise. However, this data suggests uh, that that type of progression criteria probably isn't valid and we should be progressing more on an individual and exercise-based uh, model. So to summarise that last little point there, what we've also been able to show with this data set is, yes, we can safely progress or safely accelerate the introduction of progressive hamstring loading during rehabilitation by taking a more exercise specific approach uh, to the way that we implement these uh, these exercises and interventions. It's important to also take note that this is just one piece of the pie when it comes to hamstring injury rehab and we also need a lot more participant numbers to know what the true outcome is with this sort of approach on things like re-injury in the long term.
just to finish off, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, particularly Dr. David Opar, uh, Dr. Rod Simmons, and Dr. Narav Mania, who um, you know, were instrumental in conducting this study, along with all the study uh, participants uh, who were involved uh, in this study um, over the last few years. So thanks very much for listening, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. Thanks very much, Jack. Some really challenging findings for those of us that are tipping a lot of the things that we're doing during rehabilitation on its head. But it would seem that the um, dearth of combs and other hair care products in Australia persists. But that's something I don't need to worry about too much these days. Now again, the Aspatar jet has been refuelled and we're on our way this time to uh, Northern Ireland, uh, sorry, into Dublin Island, I should say to reacquaint ourselves with Nickel Van Dyke. Nickel's well known to lots of you, I'm sure, but especially us here in Aspatar, where his bright and shiny face has uh, been an absolute fixture here for years while he did his PhD while working clinically here on hamstring injuries. These days he works for Irish Rugby as part of their medical team, but with a particular focus on injury prevention and rehabilitation. So without further ado, Nickel. Thank you, Rod, for that uh, kind introduction um, and uh, for the invitation to be part of this series. Uh, I think it's a wonderful initiative and just an incredible uh, um, achievement and effort uh, from everybody, um, maybe um, especially Dr. Popovich and Ivan, uh, for pulling this together. Um, it's a wealth of knowledge that will serve clinicians really well. And in this session, really proud uh, to speak about my contribution to our understanding of hamstring injuries uh, and the work we did while I, while I was uh, in the rehab department at Aspatar um, and part of the Aspref team. So uh, very fortunate uh, to do that. Although speaking to you at the moment from uh, rather wintry uh, Dublin um, in Ireland, where I'm working for the Irish Rugby Football Union, uh, and still very interested in injury prevention and how we best, best manage our athletes. So it's been a fortunate journey for me um, and I'm really proud to share some of the work we did while, uh, while I was at Aspatar. Um, my Aspatar journey was a, a very fortunate one and today, um, as, we've, as we've mandated, we're going to talk about what uh, has influenced our clinical practice. Uh, I think it's important to, to maybe just mention first that uh, while I was at Aspatar, I was part of a, a large team of clinicians, researchers, um, th that really made a team effort. So um, I'm really, really grateful to all these individuals who contributed to my own personal work and the work we did together. This is an old picture of the rehab department, uh, but certainly probably the one that reflects the best uh, when I was there. The uniforms have changed and, and the personnel has changed, but um, it, it was such a great team and such a privilege to be part of uh, uh, the rehab department and then also all our colleagues across this national sports medicine uh, program, without whom none of this would have been possible. So really grateful that we were able to work together collectively. And, you know, Aspidor is still, uh, um, I think, one of the leaders in, in many areas, but certainly around the work we did uh, in muscle injuries. So the two things I'll concentrate on today is that influence my clinical practice is trying to understand what it is we should be paying attention to and answering the question of how we prevent hamstring injuries or what injury prevention looks like in sports medicine. Now, I really like this quote by Mark Twain. Uh, hopefully it is him. Uh, we, we don't know these days, but it doesn't. it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And so how do we know what we know? How are we sure about the information we gather? Um, uh, and a study, and Rod brought this to my attention, that they did in book uh, making, where they looked at accuracy and confidence. So on this matrix, you can see accuracy on the left uh, y-axis and confidence on the right y-axis. So they gave folks uh, in the different amounts of information. So you can see that when, when people are given about five items of information, their accuracy and their confidence are pretty, pretty much the same. But as we give them more information, their accuracy doesn't necessarily improve, but their confidence certainly does. And that's what, that, what we're trying to say here. So it's not only about just gathering information, it's also about 
the quality of the data that you're gathering, the quality of the outcomes that you measure. So more information won't necessarily lead to better decisions, but gathering information that's relevant, that's useful, that's important, and using your own experience, uh, intuition, and judgment will then lead to, to good decisions when we're, when we're thinking of hamstring injuries. Now, this is one of my, the favorite papers we've been involved in uh, that Rod authored. It's one of those tough ones because uh, he uses what looks like pretty tricky statistics, but it's not really. And so I'm just going to go through the main messages in this paper, which I think answers that question of what we should pay attention to. So the outcome measure is on the y-axis or the vertical axis here and the treatment uh, time period. So we did it in, in deciles, so you'll get 9 or 10 essentially um, on the y, on the x-axis. So what we found with pain is if we, if we ask players to rate their pain, if the pain gets worse, probably should go back a step, right? Pain is still a relatively important outcome measure, um, but you can see that it normalizes about halfway through, and as Jack will speak about as well, maybe not necessarily, uh, not the only factor that should be influencing your decision-making, um, but certainly useful uh, uh, in terms of the overall decision-making. When length of palpation pain is half, you're halfway better. So what does that mean? So if we're palpating the area of pain, you can see that this tracks really nicely to about halfway through uh, to, to the end of the rehab. So as you're measuring the palpation length, you know when you're about halfway through your rehab or, or, or if the palpation length has halved compared to where we started, you're about halfway through your rehab, which is a nice indication of how things are going. Uh, if we look at our maximal hip flexion active knee extension test, so this was one of our tests of, of hamstring or posterior thigh flexibility, it normalizes around 50%. So it's pretty good to, to, to use, but it, not after, but halfway through the treatment, it's, it doesn't really tell us much more. So out of all the, the flexibility measures, this is the one that we found the most useful. And then in terms of strength, our outer range strength was the best measure uh, that tracks reasonably well towards the end of rehab. So it gives you a good indication of how you're progressing. And in our population, at least, um, normal strength would have been around 50% body weight. Um, and that's probably a fair assessment for most folks, um, and especially athletes. Maybe our rugby players go a little bit above that, but, uh, but in general, that's a nice little guideline to use. The other thing we looked at was the perceived running effort, so uh, compared to their outer range strength. And it looks like there's a rough correlation, not a perfect one, but a rough correlation between their outer range strength um, uh, and their running effort. So when you're measuring strength, it also gives you a nice little proxy of what the kind of running effort should be. And that's a useful indication when you're not able to treat your patients as often, uh, and especially in these times when we're not able to treat them face to face, uh, very often. That's a nice way of, of understanding how to progress the running uh, compared to their outer range strength. So some of our most useful hamstring assessments just summarized there. Now, these are the things to pay attention to. These are the outcome measures and, you know, it will be different for everybody, but certainly for us, these were useful outcome measures to think about when you're treating, uh, when, you're, when you're doing rehabilitation of a hamstring injury. So know what to pay attention to. And that's my first kind of takeaway. Um, measuring clinical outcomes influences our clinical reasoning. Um, and that's really important if you want to provide uh, your athlete with the best possible outcome. So the second thing then is, can we prevent hamstring injuries? So when we think about prevention, we often think about these kinds of things. Uh, masks, cessation of smoking, so just stop smoking, or sunscreen, right? So you're trying to, to eliminate the exposure. But what would that look like in sport? Oh, we, we can't really do this, right? This is actually a thing. This exists, uh, this kind of bubble football thing. But that would be very difficult to look for elite football playing in these conditions. So in sport, we're looking to win medals, to win cups, to be the best. Um, and the main thing should be the main thing. So um, the main, or the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So in elite sport, we can't think of prevention the same way. We really have to think of it as a risk management process. Uh, 
I think um, uh, Andy McIntosh and Royal Bar really summarizes that nicely in this four-step process. So in these four steps, we're thinking about uh, injury surveillance uh, as step one, and that helps you to identify risk for your league and for the team or the individual athlete. Step two is a season analysis. What is the season going to look like? And we, we're definitely exposed to how seasons can change now. So understanding how that might influence uh, injury. Step three would be screening athletes, and that's received a lot of attention, right? So periodic health evaluations or screening has got a lot of attention in the research. Um, and then uh, the risk management for the athlete. Do we accept that level of risk or do we change it? So we could change that into really easy questions. What are the risks for my team? How does that risk change throughout the season? Do certain athletes have a higher or lower risk of injury? And then so what? Should we do something about that? So the work that I was involved in focused mainly around step three, uh, screening and um, um, understanding the risk of injury. Uh, our Aspetor screening battery was quite extensive um, uh, and it, it continues to be. Um, I think it's a wonderful program that has been going for a number of years. And we were, we were able to tap into this collaboration between the football clubs, Aspetar, uh, and, and the governing bodies to really be able to screen uh, the uh, elite football players in, in, in Qatar. And we looked for strength. So this is the normal kind of usual suspects in terms of uh, isokinetic dynamometer, uh, quads and hamstrings, concentric and eccentric um, at high and low speed, and then a ratio of that. We looked at flexibility, uh, um, a passive knee extension test and a knee to wall test. And we looked for neuromuscular function. So we looked at the timing of the muscle and the rate of force development. And we were able to include some pretty novel devices. Well, at the time, uh, the Nord board is certainly now commercially um, uh, available, but we were able to, to include uh, one of the prototypes still in, in our testing. So really early data in terms of that. So we ended up in over six seasons, looking at over 800 players, more than 250 injuries. And it ended up being around 4,000 tests. So this is still the largest prospective cohort study that the world has ever seen. So we're really, really proud of this effort. And what did we find? So eccentric and concentric hamstring and quad strength, respectively. Yep, so strength is associated with hamstring injury. Ankle range of motion uh, indicating maybe the posterior chain and hamstring flexibility. Yep. Flexibility had a small association, significant but small association with hamstring injury. And then torque development and muscle activation, no. So it looks like that might be more affected once the player has been injured. Uh, certainly is still part of how an overall holistic uh, treatment of the athlete, but uh, we didn't find an association in our, in our group. So in a very practical way, if we had the hamstring eccentric strength on the x-axis here and the proportion of players, the number of players on the y-axis, you can see that the injured and the uninjured groups completely overlap. So the injured in red and the uninjured in blue. So most of the folks are here in the middle, but whether you're strong or whether you're kind of weak, and you've seen us present this before, it's really hard to, to identify the individual athlete that will get injured because these groups completely overlap. Um, so it's about clinical utility versus clinical validity. Yes, this is a valid thing. Yes, there is a relationship. But from a clinical point of view, we want to try and help the individual athletes. Now, if we take that knowledge, so there's some, there's some importance about strength for reducing injury. For the team, we know that we have effective tools, right? The Nordic hamstring exercise has been shown numerous times to be effective, not only in prevention, but also in some markers of performance. So in this uh, systematic review, we just looked at every study we could find, and none of them, even the ones that didn't find a strong relationship, was able to shift the overall effect. So as a rule, until the evidence changes, I think we're pretty comfortable, comfortable in saying you can include the Nordic hamstring exercise as a team approach to reduce your injuries. But for the player, and this is something that's often missed in, in this paper we published in 2017, I think there are certain things we can, we can certainly stratify risk, but also um, uh, we found a really interesting thing around our rehab. Now, this is the timeline for when we started doing screening. 
Uh, and those two papers looked at the first four seasons and 600 players and the second two seasons or two seasons after and 400 odd players. And we looked at previous injury as a risk factor, as, as you would expect. And in the first uh, one, we do find it. So, yep, that strong risk factor we always find is there. But in the second one, it kind of disappears. Now, we had to really think hard about this. Qatar is a, is a small geographic uh, location. All the clubs are, are, are uh, within our reach. So what happened? Why does the strong risk factor suddenly disappear? And what we realized is we started doing our first randomized controlled trial uh, in 2010 and then the second one around 2013. That's about to be published. Really excited about that. Um, but what happened was over the course of this time, many of the players, the majority of the players, received either rehab at Aspatar or at their clubs but following this rehabilitation protocol. Now that's freely available online um, if you wanted to have a go and look. But that meant that they were getting really good rehab. So it looks like if we're able to provide our players or athletes with a really good rehabilitation process, we might mitigate the risk of previous injury. Now, we didn't specifically test for that, but I think that's a reasonable deduction. And that's a wonderful indication to us. If we do a good job with our rehab, we'll be able to reduce the risk of injury. So Phil Glasgow, uh, who works with us here at the Irish Rugby Football Union, um, Phil, Phil says rehab is training in the presence of injury. And so I like to say, uh, I like to think that an ounce of good rehab is worth a pound of prevention. So our clinical outcomes measure, influences our clinical reasoning and injury prevention at some level, right, maybe not primary, but certainly at a, at a tertiary level is actually just good rehab and uh, doing a really good job with our athletes, making sure they get good outcomes um, when they return to sport. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for uh, uh, the invitation to be part of this session. And I'll hand over to Rod again. Um, really appreciate this opportunity. Thanks, Nicol. Uh, always great to hear your voice and your really nice way of cutting through things. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And I think that's the main thing that we learned tonight. So while we're in the Northern Hemisphere, Hemisphere we're going to stay and we're just going to jump across the pond to see Dr. Anna van der Maad, who was uh, doing his PhD here for a little while before he moved back to the Netherlands, where he's now at the Amsterdam uh, Medical Center and continues life these days. Sadly, as an orthopedic uh, registrar, we, I say sadly because I, we all thought in the rehabilitation department that Anna was perhaps one of the smartest doctors that we'd ever seen and maybe if he pushed himself a little harder he could have been smart enough to be a physio. So thanks Anna and Anna's going to tell us about an injury that might well be specific to physios but let's see. It is nice to see you again and welcome everyone to beautiful Amsterdam. My name is Anne van der Maade. I am an orthopedic resident and researcher focusing on hamstring tendon injury at the University of Amsterdam. And today I wanted to discuss the potential hamstring injury blind spot, the proximal hamstring tendon avulsion, as well as touch a bit on um, decision making once a diagnosis has been established. All right then, here we go. So first off, what I mean with a blind spot is that I think that these severe hamstring injuries are easily missed. And I want to discuss two of the clues that could point in that direction. First off, this is a graph of the number of publications cumulative over the years. And we can see that the number of publications on proximal hamstring tendon injuries has steadily risen over the past decades. Now let's add in this MRI that was the first MRI of the human being ever made in the late 70s. And now, of course, we can see that these the rise in publications has only started at that point. Now, this could naturally be a coincidence, but it could also be that we only started recognizing these injuries as soon as we started seeing them on imaging. Another clue came from our ongoing prospective series on outcome of treatment for proximal hamstring tendon avulsions. And we noted that the proportion of patients that were, were clinicians in this study was way higher than the proportion of clinicians in the Dutch adult population, which is about half a percent. But in our study, it was one in five patients. 
So at first, we jokingly concluded that there, a severe hamstring injury might be an occupational hazard, uh, but yeah, that's not really logical. So we quickly realized that it was more likely a selection because clinicians know their way around healthcare systems, know their anatomy and so on, and may therefore have a better chance at an accurate and timely diagnosis. We also know that, which, we, which you can see in the graph in the middle, that a diagnostic delay was not present in any of the uh, clinicians, either medical doctor or a physiotherapist, but was present in a substantial proportion of the non-clinicians that we had included so far. So it could very well be that uh, these clues point in the direction of misdiagnosis. We published this as an editorial in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, where you got quite a few responses of fellow clinicians that had the same experience in their practice. So it's it's important to maintain a low index, index of suspicion for these injuries, especially considering that the impact of such an injury is major uh, and you don't want to miss this to be able to treat your patients the right away as soon as possible. So let's go back to basics first, the anatomy. This is a posterior view of a right buttock area um, with five indicating the ischial tuberosity. And we can see that there's a tendon attaching onto it, which is the conjoint tendon of the biceps femoris, the long head, and the semitendinosus, which have a, a common tendon, as I mentioned. If we reflect this tendon, we can clearly see that there's another one there, which is the proximal semimembranosus tendon. So bear in mind, there are three hamstrings attaching proximally uh, by means of two attachments. So we can see why the injury happens on this coronal MRI image. Here there's a schematic view of, of muscle and tendon uh, that attaches onto the gray area, which is the issue of tuberosity, and the proximal hamstring tendon avulsions occur at the interface of bone and tendon, as seen on the right, where we can clearly see that there is a discontinuity between the tendons, which now have a wavy appearance lying in hematoma and the bone itself. So on to recognizing this injury in your practice. So the, um, the injury mechanism is a forced hip flexion combined with knee extension, which you can see happen now in the video. Uh, you can see that the gentleman uh, that's throwing the ball now slides forward with the left leg, extending the knee and his weight forcing him down into hip flexion. These patients will often uh, report severe pain with difficulty sitting um, um, and a stiff walking pattern as well as a popping or tearing sensation and severe function loss. If these patients present acutely, there is often within several days extensive bruising over the posterior thigh, as well as palpation pain over the ischial tuberosity with a palpable defect upon resisted knee flexion just distal to that, with naturally decrease in range of motion as well as strength. However, if we think that these injuries are easily missed, there must be some pitfalls that make us think that it is just a regular hamstring injury, while in fact there still may very well be a proximal hamstring tendon avulsion. Uh, and these include the subsiding and migrating bruising. Here we can see a patient after two days, seven days, and 10 days. So you can imagine that if a patient presents after, say, two weeks, the hematoma has either fully subsided or has migrated distally towards the back of the knee, so maybe you think there's a knee injury or distal hamstring injury, but bear in mind it could be a proximal hamstring tendon avulsion. Also, in addition to the injury mechanism that I just described, we have had patients with an abduction, abduction trauma, rather than a hip flexion trauma. Um, and while you might think that these patients will have an adductor injury, AD doctor, which in fact they had, low grade, um, they also had a proximal hamstring tendon avulsion. So still a possibility there. We also discussed the range of motion uh, as well as strength. Bear in mind that if a patient presents uh, after some time, so not in the acute setting, range of motion may actually be increased due to the loss of tension on the hamstring unit. And also patients might be able to flex the knee against gravity or even against resistance because there are additional muscles that can facilitate this movement. For example, think short out of the biceps femoris or gastroc muscles. So if you have any doubt regarding diagnosis, something doesn't add up, or uh, you, you might think about this injury, make an MRI, make sure that 
you can rule out this injury or if you cannot rule it out if the diagnosis is confirmed uh, so that you can move to proper decision making. Because for this type of injury, you can either go with non-operative or operative treatment. Uh, and ideally, we want to rely on literature. But unfortunately, this is where we encounter a problem because the literature is limited by methodological limitations. The body of literature is mainly retrospective, mainly based uh, on case series. And we only have a handful of non-operatively treated patients um, uh, to assess their outcome. So then a comparison of outcome um, uh, to guide us for treatment decision making cannot be made. And so with that lack of comparison, uh, we were curious to see how experts manage their decision making in clinical practice. So we did a worldwide survey, uh, including over 400 experienced sports medicine physicians and surgeons that dealt with this injury uh, almost on a daily basis. And so I will go over this uh, the study very briefly. And this is the top three indications used in clinical practice um, that help clinicians make a choice for operative repair. First one being tendons involved. If both the conjoint tendon and the semimembranosus tendon were um, avulsed or ruptured, then um, clinicians would generally choose surgical repair. If these tendons were retracted more than two centimeters from the ischial tuberosity, as well as if patients were unable to perform activities of daily life or participate in sports. And needless to say, but I, as I still highlighted it here, elite athletes that wanted to return to sports were generally operated on. So from me, the take home or in this time, maybe stay home message uh, will be beware of the blind spot. Uh, proximal hamstring tendon avulsion has likely seen you more often than you have seen it. Maintain a low index of suspicion. Beware of the pitfalls and make an MRI when in doubt. And once the diagnosis has been made, um, decision making based on expert opinion uh, can be guided by the following. Consider surgical consultation in cases of elite athletes or retracted avulsion of both attachments with the inability to participate in activities of daily living and sports. So that is all from me for now. Uh, from my side, it was a pleasure. I hope you found it informative. And then we will now go back to the place where the sun almost sh uh, always shines. Doha, back to you, Rod. Now, as I said, tonight was all about trying to find out what research can tell us about clinical practice. And we've heard from a stellar group of um, experienced hamstring researchers. We now move around to the United States where Dr. Steve Singleton of uh, Dallas or works with um, FC Dallas as well as a, a bunch of other orthopedic colleagues in the area has, whilst a senior researcher, has started earlier on his uh, journey into hamstring research. Now, unfortunately, Steve's been called off to surgery and so one of his colleagues, Dr. Gabriella Bucci, is going to present their research findings and how it's influenced their practice from their um, first foray into the field of hamstring injury over here in Texas. So, Dr. Bucci. We are honored by the opportunity to participate in this webinar with leading international sports specialists, and we would like to share with everyone our small contribution to the world of hamstring injuries in sports. In the past years, outstanding literature has been published describing classification systems to help define prognosis, return to sports criteria, and protocols to lower injury rate following hamstring injuries in athletes. In the same way, research based on therapies that could lead to an earlier return to sports have been performed and are of key importance for team health providers. Inspired by the excellence in research of our colleagues from ASPETAR and other outstanding sports leaders around the world, we conducted the first report on hamstring injuries in a professional soccer team in the Major League Soccer. The purpose of this study was to identify specific injury patterns, the location and the severity on MRIs following acute hamstring injuries in a group of MLS players. The secondary purpose was to present a new MRI classification describing the location of hamstring injuries. 
Relevant data related to the mechanism of injury was collected from the available records. Detailed description of MRI findings were reported. This included the muscle affected, length and grade of the visible edema, total length of the hamstring and the distance from origin and insertion to injury, severity of fiber disruption, low, moderate or severe, and zones involved. The zones involved in the injury correspond to the classification proposed in this study in which the full length of the muscle is divided into five zones. Zones 1 and 5 correspond to the proximal and distal tendon respectively. Zones 2 and 4 correspond to the proximal and distal myotendinous junction respectively. And zone 3 correspond exclusively to the muscle belly. Here we can see a table showing the distribution of hamstring injuries in our group of patients. A total of 19 reported hamstring injuries were evaluated by MRI. All patients were males with an average age of 25 years old. MRI was obtained in an average of 16 days from the initial injury. The most affected player position corresponded to midfielders and most injuries occurred during the early season followed by late season period. Running was the most common mechanism of injury among players, and almost 60% of the injuries occurred on the dominant leg. Interestingly, 74% of the cases involved the distal myotendinous junction, and 79% of the injuries affected more than one zone. All injuries presented with a severity of fiber disruption either low or moderate grade, and secondary findings on MRI were reported as well. The biceps femoris long head was the most common injured muscle, and in multiple cases it was injured in association with other muscles of the hamstring complex. From our available data, two re-injuries were reported during this period and both corresponded to the distal myotendinous junction of the biceps femoris long head. This MRI anatomical division with five zones and radiologist detailed injury description helps identify injuries predictive of higher time loss from competition and higher re-injury rates, including injuries involving more than one muscle, presence of muscle retraction, length of edema, involvement of the tendon, and severity of fiber disruption. This is the first study evaluating hamstring injuries in an MLS team. The findings of the current study support the previously published international literature reporting a prevalence of biceps femoris long head injuries among soccer players. Interestingly, injuries affecting the biceps femoris have been associated with faster recoveries than those involving the semimembranose. The current study also successfully demonstrated MRI distribution and location of hamstring injuries in a professional soccer team, and this classification also enhanced the hamstring muscles complex anatomy at the myotendinous junction. There are several limitations that need to be considered when interpreting the results, including the limited access to data due to restrictions from MLS authorities, which may not be representative of the prevalence of injuries amongst FC Dallas team. The current study population was limited to male professional soccer players, which may not necessarily reflect the injury characteristics within a more general population. Also, this is a retrospective review of MRI findings in one MLS team. Ideally, a prospective study would predict the amount of time missed and determine the accuracy of our predictive model from the MRIs. As future visions, the findings of increasing trend in injury rates are worrying, and prevention of hamstring injuries should be given the highest priority. Research should focus on pitfalls and opportunities on implementation of eccentric strengthening as an injury preventive strategy in soccer. Hamstring injuries are complex pathologies that might not have a punctual answer, but research might be able to focus on cost-effective treatments to accelerate recovery after injury. The already known risk factors for these injuries should be considered by all teams as future prevention initiatives. Regarding PRP therapies, we do not have good evidence yet, 
There is considerable heterogeneity among studies, lack of good methodology, including randomized control trials and control groups. Also, no significant difference in time to return to play has been reported in the current studies, or they might be underpowered to show a difference if one existed. Further research will be required to better understand the indications and ideal composition of PRP for soft tissues injuries. Thank you. Thanks indeed, Gabriella, and uh, thanks, Steve, for joining us all the way from Dallas. We move now across to Norway, where we're joined again by a former colleague of ours, Dr. Anlag Vangenstein, who did a spectacularly good PhD on hamstring injuries in part while she was here and in part while she was at the Oslo Sports Trauma Research Center, where these days she still spends some time uh, as a researcher as well as a practicing clinician close by here to the Ulval. Uh, football stadium where she works as a physiotherapist where she has been a uh, specialist sports physiotherapist now for quite a number of years despite her youthful looks. Anlag is a very experienced physiotherapist working across many sports and today she's going to talk to you again just about a very small slice of her PhD experience as it impacts on her practice. So Anlag Thank you for the introduction and for letting me be part of this great Aspetar Hamstring Online Forum, uh, Rod. And hi to you all in Doha and the rest of the world from Oslo. I'm currently working here in Oslo as a physiotherapist at NIMI, which is the Norwegian Sports Medicine Institute. And I'm seeing quite a few patients with different types of hamstring injuries. And also I'm involved with some ACL and hip related research projects. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to take part of this online forum. So in my talk today, I've been asked to talk about the prognostic role of MRI findings. Let's see here. And following a hamstring injury, our role as clinicians uh, is to guide the athletes through the return to sport process uh, starting with uh, establishing a diagnosis based on commonly uh, clinical examinations and supplemented by radiological uh, uh, imaging if needed. And then trying to give a prognosis for time to return to sport before we continuing the rehabilitation and return to sport process. But one of the really challenging part is the process related to the prognosis. And the use of MRI following hamstring injuries has been frequently debated the last decades. And this talk is not about whether we are to do MRI or not. I guess we all acknowledge that in many cases it has its important role as a supplemental tool in the diagnostic approach, especially uh, to rule out more severe pathologies such as free tendon avulsions and uh, ruptures. Uh, and also in elite sports where the external pressure is high in returning the athlete as soon as possible, MRI may be performed not only for medical reasons, but uh, also to give medical staff some leverage to um, keep the athlete sidelined if needed. However, using MRI findings to quick and accurately predict return to sport seems to be a major challenge. So the aim of this talk is to discuss and maybe uh, answer these two questions. How valuable are MRI findings for prognosis? And how do we communicate, uh, communicate these MRI findings to our athletes uh, or our patients? So to answer this first question, if we look into the evidence for, uh, for uh, prognostic factors for return to sport, there has been quite a few studies that have uh, looked at MRI uh, uh, findings as prognostic factors for return to sport. And uh, in 2014, a systematic review systemized and, and reviewed the current evidence uh, um, where they concluded based on the findings that the high, uh, the 
the quality of the studies were quite low. There was a high risk of bias and lack of multivariate analysis. And in particular, they criticized the lack of blinding for the return to sport outcome. There were no strong evidence for any MRI finding, but they found that there were moderate evidence for MRI negative injury, which was then associated with a reduced time to return to sport. And there was moderate evidence for that proximal free tendon uh, injuries was associated with longer time to return to sport. This review, several studies have been published, uh, generally with a high quality, but uh, many of them are based on the same data sets from a limited number of research group, groups. So the topic is still controversial and debated, but I will present some of the studies uh, recently published uh, related to this topic later in this talk. But first, let's just highlight the importance of uh, blinding when doing uh, prognostic uh, studies. So the outcome measure should be independent of the prognostic factor of interest to prevent bias results, which means in this case that the return to decision maker is an aware and blinded to the potential prognostic factors, such as the baseline MRI results. Simply to avoid this scenario, that you treat the image uh, rather than the patient in front of you. So this figure here quite nicely illustrates uh, the challenge with making a precise return to sport prediction. If we look at the larger prospective studies, we can say that the mean time to return to sport for all injuries are approximately 23 days with a standard of approximately 10 days. So if you look at the figure 1a here, in a normal distributed data set where 95% of all the data will fall within uh, 1.96 standard deviations of the mean. And if we then have a return to sport of 23 days and a standard deviation of 10 days, uh, there is 95% chance that the return to sport duration for an in individual athlete lies between 3 and 43 days. And this is not a very accurate estimate. So, of course, this is just a group estimate and preferably it would be ideal to narrow it down and reduce the standard deviations. Uh, um, for the individual, individual athletes by using tools where we can divide into smaller, smaller subgroups. Um, and then maybe be able to make a more precise prognosis. So this would preferably be ideal both to differentiate uh, between the return to sport for different subgroups and also for the individual athletes. And imaging findings and uh, grading and classifications based on MRI findings have been proposed for this purpose. However, uh, how valuable are these MRI findings for this purpose? And I will now go through some of the studies showing that the evidence is actually quite limited. So this is a study where we investigated the uh, predictive value of clinical examinations only, and then the additional clinical uh, additional value of MRI. So in the figure here to the left, you see a regression model for 180 patients where, uh, where we used prognostic factors uh, or only clinical factors. And on the x-axis here, you see the actual number of days from injury until return to sport. And on the y-axis, you see the predicted number of days to return to sport. The dotted line is the perfect fit. So if all the actual number of days and the predicted number of days were similar, but you see the red line here, which is the regression line, and the gray lines, which are the confidence intervals, they are really wide. And this model only explained 29% of the total variance in return to sport. So that means that you can tell the athlete based on this model that you can return within 1 to 51 days, which is not very accurate. 
But then in the second model where we added MRI findings, we could only increase uh, the, the prediction with 2.8%. So only 31.8% of the total variance uh, was explained by, uh, by this model. And now we could only narrow it down to 1 to 50 days, in which we concluded by this study that there were no additional predictive value of MRI um, uh, compared to clinical examinations only. If we look at another study, this is the UFI lead club injury study, one of the, uh, the largest prospective studies to date, uh, where they found that radiological grade correlates with return to play for grade one and grade two injuries. However, they found that the size of the edema uh, only showed weak correlations with time to return to play, and there were no correlation with anatomical location and return to play. And if you look at the figures here for the grade one and grade two injuries, there's a large, uh, there's large individual variations and also overlap between the categories. And we should also be aware with, uh, with using univariate analysis uh, when looking at prognostic factors. If we look at the mean uh, layoff times and the standard deviations in this study, the overall was 20 days for all injuries with the standard deviations of 15 days. For grade one injuries, uh, the standard deviation was 15 days and grade two, it was 13 days. So here the, the, um, the um, uh, standard deviations were quite wide and, and uh, reflecting the challenge with making a precise prognosis based on MRI grading systems. Then in another study, we wanted to investigate uh, a newer grading and classification systems uh, suggested in the literature. Uh, so here you see uh, the, the distribution of return to sport on the y-axis, and then the modified patron severity grading system, which is a simple grading system based on the severity of the injury on the y-axis. The box plots shows then the, the median time to return to sport for each of the grading classification uh, or categories. Here you see the same box plot, but for uh, the British Athletic Muscle Injury Classification System, which not only using a grading system based on the severity, but also based on the anatomical location of the injury. And as you can see, for some of the uh, categories here, we had quite a few injuries within, uh, within uh, the categories. Uh, the last system that we investigated was the Chan classification system, which is also a combination of grading severities and anatomical location systems. And here there are more categories, and as you can see, there are quite a few of the categories that had really few uh, injuries within each of the categories. And you also see a large overlap between the categories. So the total variance explained for the MRI injuries in these uh, classification systems were only between 7 and 12 percent. And what we found here was that there were few injuries within many of the categories, which made it harder to do sophisticated analysis and to do multivariate analysis. Uh, we found large variance within the categories and also a great overlap between the categories. So in conclusion, from this study, uh, we, uh, it was that MRI classifications cannot be used alone to predict time to return to sport. But then, what about the intramuscular tendon? So, um, the intramuscular tendon injury has been defined in different, uh, by different authors. Anna van der Maade, for example, has defined the uh, intramuscular tendon injury as the section of the tendon that extends along and into the muscle, thereby having muscle fibers attached to it. And it's difficult to discriminate on clinical examinations where there is an injury to the intramuscular tendon and not. So in the literature, there has been some studies uh, that has suggested that these intramuscular tendon injuries may take longer time uh, 
um, than other injuries uh, where the intramuscular tendon is not involved. If we look at the evidence, there are two retrospective studies and four prospective studies that have looked into uh, the uh, prognostic factor uh, of the intramuscular tendon and return to sport. And I will just highlight this study by Van der Maudy in 2017, uh, where you see the scatter plot uh, uh, on the screen here, showing the time to return to, to play on the y-axis, and then in figure A, the presence of intramuscular tendon disruptions and, and also the severity of the disruption, and in figure B, the presence of waviness or not. And in this study, they found that full thickness disruption of the intramuscular tendon and waviness was associated with a longer time to return to sport. However, it was slightly more than a week longer. For partial thickness and longitudinal intramuscular tendon disruptions, there were no significantly association with return to sport, and they found a considerable overlap between the groups with and without intramuscular tendon disruption, in which they concluded that the clinical significance of intramuscular tendon involvement for the individual athlete is limited. So the question then, back to this figure, is can we make a precise return to sport prediction? Well, based on the current evidence, it seems that uh, we're not able to make a precise return to sport prediction based on MRI findings. And it seems difficult to, to this date to narrow the standard deviations and narrow, narrow it down uh, to a more precise a return to sport prediction. Probably it reflects that there are so many factors involved in the results uh, and that might influence uh, the time to return to sport, um, which which might have a greater value and uh, than the MRI findings at the time of injury. Um, regarding MRI classification systems, there are currently no studies that have targeted rehabilitation to the defined MRI categories. Uh, and we don't know if that might be beneficial, but I just want to show you uh, a new idea from the British Athletics Muscle Injury Group, where they suggest uh, to inform um, um, or to use the MRI classification system uh, as specific guidelines uh, uh, for, for the rehabilitation uh, process. So this is only a suggestion and a review, but it hasn't been shown in any clinical study whether it's effective or not. It's in elite athletics cohort, and we don't know if it's appropriate for athletes in different sports or with lower tendon or muscle tendon unit demand. So further work here is needed and preferably in larger prospective clinical studies. So then how do we communicate MRI findings to our patients uh, and our athletes? Of course, uh, this is uh, what every athlete wants to know when the injury happens. How severe is the injury and when can I return? And of course, you can choose to use the mean values, which is probably uh, three weeks if you have a grade one injury. And you can tell the athlete you'll be back in three weeks. However, you will then maybe have this scenario where you have a player or you have two players where player one has a great injury and player two also has a great injury one injury. However, for play one, the actual time to return to play is 14 days. And for play two, the actual time to return to play is 40 days. So if you then tell player one to return within three weeks, and he could actually re have returned one week earlier, he might miss an important game. If you tell player two to return within three weeks, and he probably would have needed more time he might have an increased um, risk of re-injury, for example, or he might not uh, progress as, uh, as um, optimal as, as uh, you would prefer.
So we recommend not to give mean values and not to give a precise estimate because we see that that is really hard to do. But what do we tell the athletes? So based on that evidence, we can say that the prognosis is based on a clinical reasoning process to which the MRI findings may contribute. However, we cannot use the MRI findings alone to give you an accurate prognosis. And there are large individual variations between each athlete and just after injury. So we can only give you some rough estimate, estimates. So for example, if it's a negative MRI, you'll probably have a good prognosis and a quite quick time to return to sport. If it's a subtotal or a complete avulsion injury, this will probably take you several months. If it's a grade one or grade two injury, it's really difficult to give you a precise estimate just after your injury. You will probably return between one and 58 days. And if your tendon is involved, it may take a bit of time, but it doesn't necessarily have to do so. It may also depend on your sport and your high speed running demands. So finally, what we would urge the athletes to focus on is that an MRI is just a screenshot after injury and there may be many factors that can influence your return to sport duration. So we would uh, urge you to focus on your daily progression and your goals throughout the return to sport pro uh, process, which will lead you to, uh, to the return to sport and your return to performance. And with that, I just want to thank you for the attention and uh, showing you a nice picture of how we deal with the corona here in, in Norway. Well, we've got one more trip to go in the Aspatar jet. We've got to go a thousand kilometers south now, more or less, due south, back to see Dr. Hans Toll in the Netherlands. Uh, Hans is a doctor who's spent a whole bunch of time here over the last 10 years or so, as well as the U University of Netherlands. But these days, I guess his favorite place to be is right here at the Ajax uh, football stadium, where he also works as team physician with the Ajax football team. I understand they're not too bad. I'd like to thank Hans for joining us tonight, and I'd certainly love to share some of the Dutch he's taught me to say, but unfortunately, I'll probably get thrown in jail if that happens. So let's go straight on to Hans. Rod, thanks for the invitation. And uh, it's now 10 years ago I had my interview with Espada. Uh, so I'm after you're still involved. At the back, you'll see uh, one of the weekends we had in, I think, the beginning of 2012, one of these desert traps, trips. I'm now back in Holland and now I'm visiting Esther. And thanks for the invitation. I'm going to tell you something about return to performance after hamstring injury. Salam alaikum. So good afternoon, good night for everybody who's listening. We're going to focus on return to running performance after an acute hamstring injury. And over the last 10 years, and you all already saw it in the previous speakers, we had a lot of focus and a lot of efforts on the period between injury till return to play. And especially in team sport, return to play is the first team training. I think over the last 10 years, there were 15 randomized controlled trials published, 100 studies, and also when you look at ESPETA, two RCT completed and 20 studies. However, it all stops at return to play. And when you work in the field, so I work now at a club, you recognize that there's almost nothing known about the period between team, to team training and return to performance. And over the upcoming five to 10 minutes, I'm gonna focus on the period between return to play and return to performance. Because there are only four studies published on this uh, return to performance. So this is one study, it's from a chap from Australia, his name is Rodney Whiteley. I think it's Rod, yeah, with his team from Australia. They did a really, really nice study in Australian football. They showed that about 50% have a reduced high speed running distance decrease after return to play. So the running distance is decreased. Another study from Spain, from Mendigucha, where they 
did it in real football, so in soccer, and they found out that sprinting performance is reduced just after return to play. So players are back on the field, and they found out that sprinting is decreased performance. So when you're working at a club and you read this paper, you said, okay, decreased running and sprinting performance. And the question arises, should I, should we change our clinical practice based on these studies? And we also had the same question at our club in Amsterdam. And we ask us the question, when is return to match performance reached? And I'm going to show you some data we collected over the last three years. Five teams were involved, and we compared the match running performance before and after injury. For this study, we included athletes, football players with a muscle injury. Today, we're going to focus on the hamstring, but we have the same data set on the rectus, the adductor, and also on the calf muscle. We included injuries of at least seven days. And for making a reliable comparison with the pre-injury data, we included match play over 45 minutes. And around the world, and also in Amsterdam, we use two systems. That's a local system. It's a little bit more reliable. You can also measure deceleration, acceleration, and a global system. And the advantage of the global system that you can use it everywhere in the world. So during also all games, not only at the home games. So we were interested in maximal velocity. So when they come back to maximal sprinting velocity, the total distance they cover during a, a game, high intensity distance and the sprint distance. And I think this is an important slide also when you work at a club because you want to compare with pre-injury data. And then you have to make a choice. But what you can see and learn from this slide, on the x-axis we present uh, the number of games, so minus five means five games before the injury, and on the y-axis you see the velocity. And then you will see that also when they are uninjured, there's a variance of maximal velocity. And you have to take that into account if you want to compare post-injury data. But nevertheless, they will have their injury, then they will start with the rehab, and they will have the first team training. That's in gray here. So the young, the right side of team training, that's return to play. And now we have got the next phase, the team training, and what you will see on the X axis, the first game. And the dotted red lines, it's a little bit technical, these also present the error of your system. So we can measure, for example, in a speed of 34 km an hour, <clears throat> but we know there's an error. So we have to estimate it between 35 and 33 km an hour. So that's the limitation you have <clears throat> with these GPS systems. But nevertheless, you can use it in your own club if you also use GPS. So that's a little bit more the technical background. And when you work in the field, you're always interested in what are the results. And I'm going to show you the results now. And these results are new and maybe even a little bit different from what is already known. So pay attention. The first one is the maximal sprinting velocity. And what you see here on the i-axis is the number of games after return to play. So one represents the first game after return to play, two represents the second game after return to play. And what can you learn from this slide? 83%, I repeat, 83% return to maximal sprinting velocity in the first or second game, and 50% even in the first game. The second parameter. Again, on the y-axis, the number of matches after return to play. And here, all players returned to the normal total distance in the first game. 
So total distance, you can expect that they can reach it already in the first game. The third one, the high intensity distance. And of here you see the velocity. And also the 89% return to a high intensity distance in the first or second game. That's 83% in the first game. And the final one, sprinting distance. You can always discuss uh, what is your cutoff. We had it at 22.5. You can even uh, make it a little bit higher. But nevertheless, and we were really surprised with this, sprint distance is not impaired. In the first game, after return to play, 95% reached their pre-injury performance. And even when you take the second game into account, all players return to their sprint distance in the first or second game. And I started with these slides on decreased sprinting and sprint performance, which we expected to find also in hamstring injuries. But I showed you that the majority of these players they reach pre-injury performance level in the first or second game. And you, when you work in clinical practice, like I do, one head with a recess head and one head uh, clinical practice, should these findings change your clinical practice? And the answer is very simple, yes, it should. Because these results show that it is possible to reach your pre-injury performance level in the first game following hamstring injury. I repeat, it's possible to reach a pre-injury performance level already in the first game after hamstring injury. So that's a clear and very important message if you're dealing on a daily basis with athletes and you've got access to GPS. So this is with my clinical, of with my practical head. Now with my research head, I would always say, yes, it's correct, but be aware all research on return to performance, we have just started with this. And there's almost nothing done. And it's a very, very important field to study. So what is next? I think the next focus, and I touched it a little bit, but the next focus is also to have a look at the period between return to team training, what we call return to uh, play in most studies, and the period before till return to performance. Because there's a lot of things happening, number of training, number of partial games between return to team training and return to performance. Nevertheless, to make it very simple, and it's really relevant for your daily clinical practice, yes, it's possible to return to pre-injury match running performance already in the first match. And I think when you work on a daily practice, the focus should be on this, and we should develop more research on the period just before the first match. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Hans, for the last talk this evening, and I'll just um, reassure you that there's absolutely no truth to the rumor that if anybody does any research that contradicts any of mine, that I in any way sabotage their presentations. Uh, well, that draws the evening to a close.